Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for watching. Um, as you can see, a different set today. I'm not happy about it. I'm not in my car. I'm in a hotel room in Cincinnati. I had a speaking uh, gig last night, and so that's why I'm here. I don't like the... It, it, it's way too open. It's way too big. I like to be in the enclosed cocoon of the car. I don't really like the... What's the opposite of claustrophobic? Is it agoraphobic or is that something else? I don't know. But whatever it is, that's what I. That's how I feel. I just I, I in the sitting in this vast fifty square foot hotel room. It's just very bewildering. But I'll try to get past it so we can talk because this is an important topic. I want to get into. A couple of things happened last week that uh, I've been wanting to do a video about for a few days now. First, Hawaii became um, either the fifth or sixth ho- uh, state to to legalize euthanasia. And a few days before that, there was a disturbing story out of Canada, which, by the way, Canada is the source of quite a few disturbing stories as of late. Canada is like the new Florida or something. I don't know what's going on up there in Canada, but you guys need to figure that thing out. Um, In this case, it was uh, about an elderly couple who was married for over 70 years, and they decided to commit suicide together. Or as the media puts it, they decided to receive a a doctor-assisted death. So that's the new, you know, we went from suicide to euthanasia to doctor-assisted suicide. Now we call it receiving a doctor-assisted death. So you're receiving death like, uh, you know, it's a gift. It's It's like a gift that you receive on Christmas morning, except in this case, it's poison in your veins and you're dead. So we're receiving death. If, if you ever wonder why we call our culture the culture of death, that's why. Because we, we are literally treating it like a gift that we've given someone, like a birthday present. Um, their names were George and Shirley Brickenden, and they decided that they wanted to commit suicide together. So they, they um, announced it to the family, and they went through a series of, they had a reception, they went through a series of, these macabre kind of farewell ceremonies, much like you you may, you know, if you maybe walked into a restaurant or something and you saw it going on, you would think, oh, they're having a retirement party or, oh, they're, you know, they're moving to, they're moving down south to a, to a new, to a retirement home. uh, And everyone's coming to say goodbye. No, they were doing this because they were killing themselves. Um, When the time came, we're told by the media reports, they laid in bed together and they held hands, and then a doctor injected poison into their veins, a lethal injection, just like they would do to, um, to criminals, to convicted murderers. And their closest loved ones, apparently, stood at the, stood at the foot of the bed and watched their parents um, die. Now, they are not the first married couple, I hate to say, who have received death in this way. Um, A couple in the Netherlands had what they called their deepest wish fulfilled when they committed suicide together. A couple in Oregon had their own wish fulfilled a few years ago in the same kind of way, a few months ago, actually. You know, it was originally claimed, if you're wondering why you should care about this, well, we're going to talk about that. But first of all, you should care about it because it's just disgusting, inhumane, and horrific. But also, it was claimed originally that euthanasia would be something, we would reserve it only for individual adults who are terminally ill. That's what we said, we were told. That's all it is, individual adult, terminally ill, on their deathbed, um, then they can get euthanasia. But as with everything else with the left, the analogy I've used before is um, when when you were a kid, maybe you read the book, uh, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And that's all about this cookie that, you know, the kid gives him a, or a mouse, the kid gives the mouse a cookie, then he comes back and he wants a glass of milk, and then he wants a napkin, then he wants a fork for some reason. And before you know, he's, 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 he's eating them out of house and home because he just kept, the kid just kept satiating the mouse. So the left is a lot like that. They're like the mouse in that, in that disturbing fable where you give them one thing, except that the cookies that they want are, again, horrific. But you give them the one thing, you think that's it, and then they come back and they say, oh, actually, can I have this too? Oh, you know, while we're here, how about that as well? So it started with euthanasia, individual adults, terminally ill, and now we treat it like a romantic getaway for 
for, for elderly couples. Or, you know, we also have uh, in Europe, and I'm sure it will be here soon enough, euthanasia for people who are depressed, euthanasia for people who are alcoholics, euthanasia for children. That's what's happening in Europe. You see, the culture of death is a cancer, and it spreads, and it consumes, and it never, ever stops. There's, it will never get to a point where it says, oh, that's enough, we'll leave you alone. Never stops. It whittles away at life on both ends, ends of the spectrum. So we, we're working on the, the unborn babies. We're, we're um, killing them off. And then we come in on the other end with the elderly and the sick, and then we whittle them away too. Until we're kind of just, you know, we're just sort of meeting in the middle so that you're not safe unless you're a 27-year-old, college-educated, completely healthy person. That's, that's where we're headed, where that's, that's the only, you know, if, you're, if you fall into that demographic, then we can use you in society. If not, we got to get rid of you. Um, and that's why, because it's all part of this greater agenda on the left, that's why the left can barely contain their enthusiasm when it comes to euthanasia. Uh, whenever there's a famous euthanasia case, they just fall, they trip over themselves to congratulate the person. Remember, Brittany Maynard, a couple of years ago, was a famous one in, in, in Oregon, I believe. And she announced ahead of time that she was getting doctor assisted suicide. And the left and the media, they were just ecstatic. They were like, oh, she's so courageous, such a beautiful thing. And, you know, it, it, it's just imagine for a moment. I mean, I'm in a hotel room right now. It's like 20 stories high. So imagine there was a guy standing up on the roof, 20 stories up, and he was about to jump. And what the left is doing basically is they're, they're, they're coming up and they're saying, oh, wow, you're so brave. Yes, jump, die with dignity. You're so courageous. This is so wonderful. I mean, it brings a tear to my eye. It's such a beautiful thing. What really is the difference between cheering a guy on who's standing on the ledge of a building and cheering somebody on who's going to a doctor to get a poison pill or a poison injection? What's the difference? There's no difference. It's suicide either way. Now, we could try to dress up euthanasia, call it something else, you know, have them lay down in the bed. We call it medicine. We say they're receiving death. But in the end, it's the same thing as jumping off a building. In fact, jumping off a building is probably a more painless death, really. So there's no difference. That's why I get upset about it. I get upset about it for the same reason that I, that I would be upset if there was a guy on the building and then you came up and said, yeah, go for it. Or if I was trying to talk him off the ledge and you said, hey, how dare you? Mind your own business. If the guy wants to jump, let him jump. But if you did that, we would all agree that you are a monster, right? Everyone in society would agree that if you cheered on someone committing suicide, you're a monster. But if you did it in the context of euthanasia, then, well, you're just a liberal. So people were, you know, the, the left was gushing over this um, suicide. Um, and the main thing that you hear over and over again, whether it's with the Brickendens or it's with Brittany Maynard or whoever else, it's that, well, they're dying with dignity. But no, they're not. It's exactly the opposite. Now, we're told that George and Shirley, that they, you know, they lived wonderful, full lives, and they were good people. I hope that's true. I didn't know them personally. But if it is true, it makes it all the worse in the end that they chose to be put down like dogs. It just makes it worse. Because that life of dignity, they just punted in the end. And their family cheered it on and applauded and encouraged it. Where is the dignity in that? Let me ask you. When your dog gets very old and he's sick, you take him to the doctor and they strap him down and they inject something into him. Where is the dignity in a human being being discarded like that? Dignity is found when you embrace life and you persevere through difficulty. Suicide is the opposite of that. It is the op it is the diam there's there's dignity here and then there's suicide all the way on the opposite end. It, it diametrically opposed. They are, it's like up and down, north and south. Dignity and suicide. There is no such thing as a dignified suicide. A man of dignity is a man of self-respect. You can't respect yourself if you're destroying yourself. It's not possible. 
self-annihilation and self-respect cannot be the same. Because once you've annihilated yourself, there's no self left to respect. Now, here's, here's what happens. When you question the dignity of suicide, and by the way, not just with euthanasia, but um, I have found when you question the dignity of any kind of suicide, even if a guy is jumping off a building or whatever else, whenever you do that, people get very upset. They, 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 they don't want you to, to besmirch the dignity of suicide. And they say that it's cruel and it's heartless. How dare you? I've heard this many times, anytime I've talked about this subject. But you know what I say to that? How dare you? If you're in the pro-euthanasia, pro-suicide camp, you're the one who's heartless and cruel. You're the heartless, cruel monster, not me. Not only are you encouraging more people to murder themselves by glorifying suicide, but you are very clearly implying that the people who don't kill themselves yet yet are terminally ill or very old, you're clearly implying that they do not have dignity. You, what, what you're saying is, you know, if it's dignified to kill yourself before death naturally takes you, then it must be undignified to wait around for it to take you. Both of those strategies can't be dignified. So what you're saying is that a cancer patient who dies, who dies in his bed naturally, you're saying he lacks dignity. You're saying that an old man who decides to live and cherish every moment that God has given him, you're saying that he lacks dignity. If euthanasia is dignified, it is dignified because you are avoiding a slow and drawn out death. What about the ones who don't avoid it? What you're saying, if you're in, in this camp, you're saying that they are the ones who don't have dignity. So, yeah, you could accuse me of besmirching suicide. I'd rather besmirch suicide than besmirch life itself. It, 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 we're, we're so desperate in this culture to, to hold up suicide as this grand and elegant thing that we turn life into a dirty and shameful thing. These people, they, they, they hail the courage of a man who kills himself to avoid suffering. And in the process, they make a coward of a guy who, who embraces his suffering and finds meaning in it. Um, so that's the, that's the dignity part of this. There is no dignity in it. Dignity, again, is in someone who is given life and embraces it no matter how much suffering is involved. That's what it means to die with dignity. Even if you're in a hospital bed, even if, you, even if, you're, even if you're whittling away from, a, 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 from an illness or something, there's still a lot of dignity in that. And the people that accept that fate and who die with courage and, you know, on God's time. The other thing that people say about euthanasia is that it allows someone to go out their own way and to take charge and to exercise autonomy and so on. Uh, we'll say, oh, he's, they're doing it their way, right? That's what we say about the brick and dens. They're doing it their way. Well, there are a few problems with that. First of all, euthanasia is not doing it your way. You aren't taking charge of anything. If you could really take ownership of yourself, if you could really be in charge of yourself, then I imagine you wouldn't die at all. If it were up to you, you would choose not to die. But it isn't. So you have to die. So there's no taking charge of that. So, so you know, trying to take charge or do it your own way so you kill yourself before you die, that's like if you heard that a guy is coming to your house to burn it to the ground, and so you head him off at the pass by burning it to the ground yourself. And then when he shows up, you say, you see what I did? You see, I won. No, in that case, to take charge of the situation would be to stand outside your house with a shotgun, and when the guy comes, you make him leave. But you can't do that with death. 
when death comes, and it will for all of us, all you can do is accept it. You can, you can choose to accept it earlier than God intends and by your own hand, but that is no kind of victory. But I think the biggest problem here with that way of thinking is that our lives, our, our deaths as well, these are not things that we can own. People, wanna, people want to own death. You know, they want to uh, grab a hold of it. That's, that's, what, that's what euthanasia is all about. It's what the culture of death is a lot. Is much of it, that's what it's about. It's about grabbing hold of death and trying to make it into something controllable. So ironically, it's the people who fear death the most who are the ones who are in favor of euthanasia and, and, and all that. Because it's the nature of death. It's the suddenness of death. It's the unwieldy, uncontrollable nature of death that they fear, and they think they can make it a less fearful thing by grabbing hold of it and, quote, doing it on their terms. But death is not something you can grab hold of, nor should you try. It's not something you can own. For the same reason that we can't own our lives. As much as we talk about bodily autonomy, there's no autonomy. And this is what's so beautiful and terrifying and mysterious and wonderful and awful about, about life, is that it's outside of our control. I didn't decide to come into existence, to come into being. I didn't decide who I was going to be. I didn't decide what my identity was going to be. I didn't decide uh, who my parents were, who, what my family was. was. I, didn't, I, I didn't decide what, what country I would be born in. I don't decide consciously to have my heart pump and my, my lungs breathe and my blood flow. All that stuff happens on its own. I didn't decide anything about the culture, the civilization, the country that I was born into. This was all selected for me by something else or someone else. And if you're an atheist, then you believe that uh, it was all decided by a series of accidents and circumstances. And you could have just as well been born a cockroach or a tree or a, or a kangaroo. And really, there's very little difference between all of those different things. Uh, because life is happenstance and you are happenstance. You are effectively meaningless. meaningless. But even then, even from the atheistic point of view, by this logic, euthanasia makes no sense. It's a crime against nature, really. In an atheist world, all you have is this existence. That's it. And then it's over. And then you just, you just, um, you just kind of dissolve into the void. And there's nothing left of you. So the only imperative in a world like that is just to live and to extend your existence for as long as possible. That's the only point. If we live in an atheistic world, there is no point to life other than simply to live it for as long as possible, and then you don't exist. So in an atheistic world, euthanasia is a sick joke. It's a crime against the Darwinian order of things. Really. And then from a religious perspective, from a monotheistic perspective, all of this, my life, my circumstance, my identity, it was decided by a divine force, by, by God, before the beginning of time. And so I, this is the beautiful thing, that I was an idea in the mind of God. And he spoke me into existence from the midst of eternity. He plucked me out of eternity and he placed me into time, which is a beautiful thing. And I belong to him. I am his creation. I own nothing, least of all my own life. Every day that I wake up, every step I take, every pulse of my heart, all of this is sustained by God. All of it. And he has a plan. He has a reason. Every morning when I wake up, it's, okay, well, that's another, I guess I get another day. Or at least another few moments. And there's a reason for that. You might not understand the reason. I might not understand the reason completely. But there's a reason. If God, you know, God decides when your time is up, when your story's finished, there's going to come a point when your story really is finished, when it's been told. 
when you've done everything you could do or that God wanted you to do. Um, and for better or worse, that's the end of it. Last page, right? That time will come. And we don't know when. And some people end up with much bigger books than others. But that's for God to decide. And to reject the life that he's given me, to reject even one day of it, to reject one hour, one minute, is a terrible thing. It's the worst thing in the world. Because I've not only rejected my life, but I've rejected the entire world. The, the world that he has made for me, I have rejected it. I've said, I don't want it anymore, God. And in doing that, I've also rejected God. So take your pick. Either you believe in God or you don't. Um, you're an atheist or you're not. Maybe you're somewhere in between. But no matter where you fall on the spectrum, euthanasia is a horrific, horrible, terrible thing. And we should all be against it. And I haven't even talked about, um, to say this for another video, but uh, the other big problem with euthanasia, aside from, not that I really need to list any more problems with it, aside from what I've already said, but we have the continued perversion and degradation of the medical profession. You know, Doctors are supposed, it's the Hippocratic Oath, doctors uh, are, do no harm. They're always supposed to heal and treat and cure. That's the job of a doctor. And because of abortion and now with euthanasia, we have also made doctors into merchants of death. Which is the exact opposite of what they're supposed to be, of what, what they're supposed to be. We need doctors to cherish life. And it becomes a very, you know, once euthanasia becomes commonplace, as it is uh, not quite here yet, but in some parts of the world, once it becomes commonplace, it's, uh, it's quite a conflict of interest for a doctor or a conflict of something. It's certainly an internal conflict. Because in one room, you know, he goes to see a patient and the patient is terminally ill. The patient wants to live. So the doctor's fighting for his life. The next room over, say, you know, a guy has the same terminal illness. And in this case, he wants to die. The doctor says, okay, here's some poison. No, we want doctors to be, to be wired to fight always for life. Once they start dealing out death as well, it's, it's the end of the medical profession. And I think that's a pretty serious downside as well. All right, that's it for me. Hope you guys have a great weekend. I'll talk to you on Monday.